Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello friends, I welcome you back to the lecture series on Introduction to Science Fiction Studies. In the previous lecture, we have seen how science fiction is a part of speculative fiction, a sub-genre of speculative fiction. We have also come across a writer called David Seed who has said that science fiction is a intersection point where all the genres of love, comedy, romance, thriller, horror, everything comes and mixes and there you find all of these things alongside the science aspect. So in this lecture we are going to look at the entire history of science fiction writing practices, the theories that there are so that when we move forward ahead from this point everything will fall into place so let me give you a road map that is why i have titled this lecture as a road map to the history of science fiction studies throughout the world the ages and eras in science fiction studies this entire topic is a kind of reflection on the changing styles forms themes, articulation, expression in science fiction studies. So one topic cannot go on forever, one theme cannot sustain forever. There will be changes, change is what that gives meaning to life. Therefore, the science fiction, its modes, its approaches has not been the same as you see it now. The movie Avengers or the Iron Man suit, this has not come in one day. Rome was not built in one day. This is an, a trial of all the predecessors of science fiction who had already imagined or speculated on these subjects way back since time immemorial, since the classical days, since the Greek literature was being conceived. So before we move on to the details, first let us have an idea, a bird's eye view. Do you know why it is called a bird's eye view? Because a bird flies very high and when it looks down, it can see a lot of things in one quick glance. So here is a bird's eye view of all the ages and eras of science fiction. Proto-science fiction. This is the early modern period, 16th to 18th century. Again, let me tell you that this is not conclusive. These demarcations, these distinctions between the ages are very fluid. So some writers who belong to proto-science fiction category can also be somewhere in the 19th century science fiction category. But this is a rough kind of demarcation, rough kind of border that we have created in order to understand the themes that change, in order to uh, express or rather express in our ideas what do we understand by change or evolution of a subject? The second is 19th century science fiction. Third is the most important and by far the most influential of all the science fiction eras. That is golden age of science fiction which is the 1930s to 1950s and mostly the American authors had a great role to play in this era particularly the big threes and the ABC of science fiction will come to that later on. Next we have the new wave science fiction which is from 1960 to 1970s, cyberpunk and post cyberpunk uh, science fiction from 1980s to 1990s, contemporary science fiction late 20th century to the present. So this part is still evolving. We are still experimenting with the ideas of thoughts, feelings, emotions, intelligence quotient has been replaced by emotional quotient, has been replaced by social quotient. So all the ages have their own emphasis points. At one point of time, flying machine was very exciting. But nowadays we are talking about artificial intelligence where uh, 
machine can think like a human being can you imagine how much time effort and ideas that has taken human beings to develop this kind of machines so all these ages have significantly contributed to making science fiction as it is today we will start with the proto science fiction early modern period 16 to 18 centuries the word proto please don't be intimidated by this big uh, words because they are actually giving you a very fine simple idea that is what existed when there was no established domain of science fiction i will always be very much happy to know what happened before i was here so that i can contribute meaningfully to that field so in order to contribute today to the field of science fiction to the study of science fiction to the uh, creation of science fiction we need to understand what was there before science fiction right from ovid's metamorphosis ovid is a classical writer classical i by the word classical i mean he is a greek writer he was there during the uh, european classical era if you just google european classical writers you will find a host of names starting from homer from sophocles and then you will find aristotle all of these people uh, were the pioneers of european classical literature at the same century in the same timeline you will also find a person called ovid and he wrote a humongous a very big book known as metamorphosis please let me tell you this is not the one by that book by kafka metamorphosis it has one single story but here ovid's metamorphosis which is plural as you can see this particular thing not s i s but s e s this book has a number of small stories put together and these stories are about changing of the form people are turning into animals and this thing is a uh, an innovative a very creative idea that is why uh, the idea of metamorphosis that is changing of the form of a person is a kind of idea where we are speaking about body changing that is changing of the human dna changing of the genetic material so these things at that time did not have any kind of um, expression but nowadays we know what that means if we want a person to grow in a certain way we will change the dna we know that through genetic engineering technologies we have that kind of tech support in today's world that we can regrow an arm if we want and that is called therapeutic cloning let me tell you that a person's arm can be regrown but it has not been sanctioned by the government it is a very it is at a very experimental stage so therapeutic cloning is there reproductive cloning is there but we never thought that this will be a reality at least ovid who was there in 4th century bc he never thought of anything called genetic engineering but he had an idea that suppose a form of a bird a body a uh, changes the shape of a body changes how it will be so these are the proto science fiction literary works mostly what happened before the hard science fiction set in was that imaginary journey to other worlds these were the common stories visualizing a person going into a different world where people suppose have three hands instead of one they have three eyes they they have alien features these were the things that had the element of science fiction in them or had the seed of science fiction in them we will shortly look at more scientific uh, we will shortly look at some other works that will confirm this idea another thing is utopian societies there are two terms utopia and dystopia in utopia 
everything is good everybody is happy everybody is enjoying freedom everybody is sharing food comfort property nobody is high nobody is low nobody has extra benefits nobody gets extra privileges everybody is equal and in dystopia it is a nightmarish kind of reality in that kind of reality everybody is dehumanized some have total control over all the assets all the properties and some are very poor they do not also own their own bodies their organs are for somebody else that is a nightmarish society reality so these two kind of realities societies communities are works of fiction that is in the imaginative realm the authors imagine societies like we have thomas more's utopia which was written in 1516 and it talked about a socialist state that a very good state where everybody was happy almost they lived a monastic kind of life then we have johannes kepler johannes kepler 1571 to 1630 this is the timeline of johannes kepler he wrote a book called the dream somnium thus in 1608 the story is like this a young man who travels to the moon in a dream and encounters lunar inhabitants moon is the word and lunar is the adjective if i want to say that this is from moon i will say it is a lunar uh, life a lunar rock a lunar view whatever is related to the moon is actually expressed by the word lunar so lunar inhabitants is people from the moon so as you see johannes kepler he was contemplating alien life the possibility that human life is not the only intelligent life species on this solar system at that time there was no rockets there was no aerospace um, stations there was no way to go to moon but imagination is such a priceless possession of all the scientific writers that they can imagine more that Uh, than what they can actually see. Cyrano de Bergerac, 1619 to 1655, he wrote a book called The Other World: The States and Empires of the Moon, very similar to what Johannes Kepler had already written. There, it isn't a dream. In this case, Johannes Kepler's, it is a dream, and in this case, it is an actual voyage. So you see. how from a dream it turns into an actual voyage so the transition the evolution of the idea you can see in these two works a voyage to the moon and interactions with its inhabitants the same trope but only this time it is not a dream anymore it is a reality margaret cavendish 1623 to 1673 she lived for only 50 years and she had written a wonderful book called the blazing world published in 1666 and there she talks about a woman who discovers a utopian world through a portal at the north pole some people strongly claim that it is feminist text and she is one of the earliest feminist science fiction writers but putting aside the feminism and talking about the humanism even then for that time a portal at the north pole can you even imagine she was discussing warm holes she was discussing black holes where space is something that can be bent i'm sure all of you are familiar with the movie interstellar or the concept of warm holes and black holes if not let me give you a very brief idea if this is suppose it is we have this small napkin in front of us if we this suppose this is the space that we live in and in this space we know that there are things and everything around us suppose we are able to bend it like this and here let me give you an idea we are here this is 
let's say this is uh, Delhi. We want to go to Kolkata. This is the distance that we have to cover. What if the space between these two can be bent like this? Then right we can travel from Delhi to Kolkata in one second. So that is a portal. This bending of the space is a portal and that about that Margaret Cavendish was talking in 1660s as early as possible. So can you imagine the evolution of the idea? We are not covering the distance to the moon anymore, but we are actually doing it using a portal. Then we have Jonathan Swift, 1667 to 1745, Gulliver's Travels. The travel motive is very strong, be it time travel, space travel, travel is always a motive. In 1726, he wrote a satire. Actually, it's a four book, big kind of uh, uh, expression of this travelogue, The Voyages of Lemuel Gulliver to various strange and imaginary lands, including a trip to Laputa, a floating island with advanced technology. So, if you are familiar with Gulliver's travels, maybe you remember him from the study of the Lilliputians, that is the small people. There was a movie in India that was released, I think, 10-15 years ago. The name is Jajantaram Mamantaram and uh, there you will have the story of the Lilliputs and the giant. That is exactly the story of Gulliver. So Gulliver goes to Lilliput and islands of the Lilliputs but he also goes to another island called the Laputa. The Laputa is a civilization which is very much technologically advanced, more advanced than we are currently living in, or at least Jonathan Swift was currently living in. Then we have Voltaire. Voltaire is otherwise very famous as a philosopher, as a political commentator, but even then, he had written something in 1752, Micromegas, a short story where two giant visitors from other planets, one from Saturn and the other from Sirius, who explore the universe and encounter Earth. So, Earth is being observed by people or aliens. This is the first time that Earth is being described from a foreign perspective. So we are no longer at the center of attention. We are or has become the subject of attention. That is somebody from outer space has come and their description of what they are seeing in Earth is described in this short story called Micromagus. Now, let us move on to the 19th century science fiction. This is one of the best parts of science fiction because most of us here are able to connect to these names because we have heard them once or twice in our lifetime. Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus published in 1818 by Mary Shelley. Let me tell you, Mary Shelley is actually related to Percy by C. Shelley. She is very much intelligent and politically active. She was the wife of the famous poet P. B. Shelley and the daughter-in-law of the famous political figure William Godwin. So, where you find all of these things, uh, you will be surprised to know that the place when she was writing Frankenstein, the age that she was writing Frankenstein in was very dedicated to return to nature, talking of childhood ideals, to Wordsworth is there, Keats is there, everybody is around but she had a different vision. She wrote a book about a scientific e experiment which created a monster. A gothic tale follows Victor Frankenstein. Frankenstein is a scientist 
who creates a grotesque but sentient creature. Sentient means self-aware in an unorthodox scientific experiment. Unorthodox, it is uh, meant to um, express that nobody follows that kind of scientific experimental techniques. That is why unorthodox scientific experiment. The novel explores the themes of ambition, responsibility and the consequences of playing God. So this is one of the most fascinating features of that time. Everybody who were devoted to science, they were thinking that we are like God. Let me tell you a little bit why this thought was there. Because at that time, Church of England was very strong. The church, the religion was a very powerful idea in the European continent. But on the other hand, science was also gaining momentum. And the people who were devoted to the scientific studies, they were challenging the notions of um, the religion. No, God did not create us. We were created by some protein accident. It is evolution that we are human beings. So, if we are able to create bacteria, if we are able to create viruses, if we are able to fight off diseases which are given by God, then we are equal to God. That is what the feeling was moving around in that society. And then Mary Shelley dropped the bomb of Frankenstein. She said, no, playing God is a very dangerous game. If one thing or the other goes wrong, then this is what you get. You get a monster. So what Frankenstein actually did was he took body parts from different people, stitched them up together and put them on a lightning conducting machine. And in one fateful night, the thunder struck and that human being, which was a mix of mix and jumble of many parts of other human beings, that dead body came to life. And when it came to life, it started cursing the creator, saying that you cannot make me. And if you had made me, then you have to make a soulmate or another person. If I am a man, you have to make a female for me as well. So there Victor Frankenstein said, no, you are the only last creation that I will do. And the person, the person who has come back from the dead, started hunting for Victor Frankenstein, that I will kill you. It's a very interesting story. You can go and have a read. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. A novel, it is of course a novel. A professor joins an expedition to hunt a mysterious sea monster. Soon discovers that the creature is the Nautilus, a highly advanced submarine captained by the enigmatic Captain Nemo. So in this story by Jules Verne, often he is French, so the English call him Jules Verne, the French prefer Jules Verne, but let us stick to Jules Verne. He talks about a professor who gathers a crew in a ship and goes in search of looking for a sea monster which has been sighted in many places. Right. Later on, they discover it is not a sea monster. It is a highly advanced submarine that is moving from one place to another and it is captained by somebody called Captain Nemo. Next, we have The War of the Worlds published in 1898 by H.G. Wells. H.G. Wells is another very influential writer you will come across multiple times throughout this core study. It is a novel and talks about the invasion of earth by Martians. So at that time, you see, once it was the dream of going to moon, the idea was the dream of going to moon. Now we have ideas like Martians, the life on Mars coming to earth and eating people, destroying civilization, taking over the planet and doing all sorts of things like that. Using advanced technology, including tripod fighting machines and heat rays. So they are annihilating the entire human civilization by using these machines. 
Journey to the Center of the Earth, again by Jules Verne, a novel. Professor embark on a perilous journey to the center of the earth through an Icelandic volcano. They discover a prehistoric world full of strange creatures and landscapes. So let us consider this. One professor goes in search of a lost island or lost land which is which can only be entered if you enter a volcano. So this is again a travel kind of quest and also gives us an idea about a utopian society. Prehistoric world, a world which is not civilized, the world which has no touch of urbanization and it had strange creatures and landscapes. The landscapes were also not very much equal to the landscape we have now. So this land they have is untouched by time. Moving on to time, The Time Machine by A.G. Wells again. It is a small novel, a novella, an unnamed time traveler invents a machine allows him to travel to a distant future. He discovers a world where two distinct species have evolved from humanity, representing different social classes. So here you see that again, future of earth is being seen, future of earth is being seen from the perspective of the present human being. Our world, human being, travels to the future world, sees that humans have developed into two different species. One is, the names are not mentioned here. Once you, uh, we will talk about this in details and then I will mention the names representing different social classes. So, class-based division has taken place. So, can we not call it a social commentary as well? That is why again, we come to our previous point that science fiction is an intersection of many genres. So we see there is social commentary also in this particular work. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, one of the famous or most famous stories that ever has is the story of split personality. Once I am very happy and the second time I am very angry. I am sure all of us are familiar with the character of the Hulk from Avengers. There you will see Hulk is actually an uh, in normal day to day life. He is a scientist. He invents a kind of serum which gives superhuman strength to the body. Once he injects that serum, he can turn into the green monster called the Hulk which has very powerful arms and legs and muscle power, everything. So that story has evolved from this particular story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde which is written by Robert Louis Stevenson. I'm sure you are familiar with the name of Robert Louis Stevenson because he is associated with the invention of steam engine. A gothic science fiction novella explores scientific themes related to human nature and the duality of good and evil. Dr. Henry Jekyll's experiments with altering his personality lead to the creation of the sinister Edward Hyde. So Dr. Henry Jekyll starts experimenting, injecting himself with all sorts of experimental drugs and by drugs I mean medicine, okay? So all those experimental medicines and his personality changes, he becomes evil. So when he is Dr. Jekyll, he is a very good scientist, very amiable. As soon as he turns into Edward Hyde, he is hiding from everybody and is almost a carnivore, kills everybody, slashes everything, smashes everything. So this personality is again a very interesting theme that has recurred uh, in many future stories that you will see. Flatland, I am sure you by hearing this word you are getting an idea of a land which is flat. Exactly, the earth. The earth is flat all around you but we know the earth is actually a sphere. A Romance of Many Dimensions by Edwin A. Abbott, a satiric novella set in two-dimensional world called Flatland, 
inhabited by geometric shapes. It serves as a social commentary on Victorian society while exploring the concept of higher dimensions. So let me give you pictographic idea of what is flat land. Flat land is this. This is a flat land. It has two dimensions. One is the breadth. Another is the length. This are the two dimensions. For earth, we have a third dimension called the height. Right? But this is the height that we have. The height adds to the 3D, the three dimension of our reality. But as soon as you remove this height, all we are left with is two dimensions and on two dimensions you cannot draw a human being because the human being has a height only you can draw is a geometric shape these are the shapes these are the characters that live inside this two-dimensional world so actually this entire story is about the limited understanding of reality of the people belonging to the Victorian society while living in the Victorian society every everybody had a limited understanding of the reality they thought that they are doing the best but they were not uh, fulfilling the potential they were creating restrictions they were trying to mold the society according to the rules and regulations of their customs, not letting science into their life. So all these reservations were making the Victorian society a very closed kind of society with no enlightenment. The women were not allowed to read. The women were only given conduct books. The women were never put for education. Only the men had access to education. So all of these things are a part of Flatland. These ideas have been very, very nicely disguised and presented in the story of the Flatland. Now we come to one of the best eras that science fiction has ever envisioned. That is the golden age of science fiction from 1930s to 1950s. What are the main features of this era? Let us discuss them. Emergence of pulp magazines. Pulp magazines prepared from cheap materials. That is why pulp. The paper that was being prepared was from very inexpensive. So the print was also inexpensive and everybody could buy them. Before this what happened was the paper that was being produced, the paper which actually was uh, used to print books was very costly. So not everybody could buy books. During this period, everybody was able to buy these kind of magazines. The publishers therefore started getting stories from all around the globe and publishing them in these pulp magazines which are very inexpensive and easily accessible to everybody. Everybody can buy one. So, everybody could buy one. Therefore, literature also became a little cheaper. Everybody was writing literature and everybody was reading literature. And science fiction was one of the most fascinating domains that became a hit the very first time. A surge in science fiction literature. The science fiction that was being written during this page were mostly during this age were mostly published in these kind of pulp magazines. So everybody was aware of what is happening in the science fiction reality. During this age, we also have the ABC of science fiction and also alternatively the big three of science fiction. We will discuss them in a separate lecture. But for now, let me introduce you to the ABC of science fiction that is Asimov, Bradbury and Clark. These three writers 
were very very influential along with Heinlein because it Robert Heinlein was the big three of science fiction okay these three writers were very influential along with Robert Heinlein but we cannot say A C H of science fiction so A B C of science fiction and in a different way big three of science fiction so during this era we have the foundation series by Isaac Asimov a novel the first foundation series introduces the concept of psychohistory a science that combines history sociology and mathematics to predict the future of large populations it follows the efforts of mathematician harry selden to save humanity from a predicted dark age dune 1965 by frank herbert since we are taking the a b c or the big 3 in a separate presentation in a separate lecture we will discuss the age and its many important works here and uh, the authors and their works will be in a different lecture separately so you needn't worry at all so these are very iconic works and we need to know about them in 1965 dune was written by frank herbert although technically published just as the gold, after the golden age dune is often associated with this period set on the desert planet arrakis the novel explores the themes of politics religion and ecology as young paul atreides rises to become the messianic figure known as muad'dib so this is a story which discusses politics religion ecology and the messianic figure that is a person who is almost like a prophet who saves everybody so that is the story which frank herbert has written during the golden age stranger in a strange land by robert a henlin although published a bit later this novel is considered a significant work from the golden age it follows valentine michael smith a human raised by martians as he returns to earth and becomes embroiled in human society childhood's end by arthur c clarke in this novel mysterious alien overlords come to earth and oversees a utopian transformation of humanity the story explores the themes of human evolution and the implications of contact with advanced extraterrestrial civilizations so here also you see the idea of alien life is becoming more and more is gaining popularity becoming more and more popular that we are not the only intelligent life species on this entire galaxy that there are other forms of life that we will encounter in future so robert henlin and arthur c clark both writes this kind of story during the golden age Fahrenheit 451 this is one of the most interesting story about books and book burning it's written by ray bradbury and published in 1953 and dystopian novel it's a dystopian novel that is the society is very nightmarish people are not given their rights their rights have been discontinued future society where books are banned so you cannot read a book books are banned you cannot read literature you cannot have knowledge you cannot have access to the everyday science you need and firemen it's a very satiric name because in our society those we call as firemen they are sent to a house which is on fire or a place which is on fire and they are sent to extinguish that fire but in this story in this particular story fireman is actually putting a fire on house putting a house on fire because the house carries books fireman burn any that are found that is any books and the major character the protagonist a fireman who begins to question the oppressive regime he serves so whenever there is an oppression whenever there is an action there will be an equal and opposite reaction that is newton's third law so 
whenever there is a government there will be an opposition government wherever there is a power there will be a another counter power a force will produce another counter force similarly in this book the government is saying you burn all the books there will be one person at least one person who will say no and here we will find in this book how that becomes a part of science fiction next we move on to another very interesting story ring world by larry niven a novel an enormous artificial ring world constructed around a star and the adventure of a group exploring it so before this you had the story of flatland if you remember we were discussing flatland remember where we discussed that the land was flat now in this particular story you have the ring world that is the world is like a ring it is no longer flat but it has become a complete ring and it is constructed around a star and the adventures of a group exploring it see the development of ideas once it is a two dimensional space that we are thinking about now it is a complete ring around a star like an orbit that we are talking about the stars my destination by alfred bester a novel a vengeful man stranded in space who gains the ability to teleport his quest for revenge leads to a journey of self discovery and transformation teleporting is also another a very very interesting concept we know telephone telephone is your voice can be heard at a very long distance right because um tele is actually you know covering the distance in a very short time that is what tele stands for so your voice is being sent from here to there in a very uh, short distance so teleport is you are being deported your place you are changing your place so now at this point i am here and suddenly i want to go to let's say banaras the moment i think it i will be in banaras so that is called teleporting that entire concept is so somebody who is stranded in space somebody who is captured restrained is lost in space who cannot get out of that he gets the power of teleporting and he comes back for revenge whoever has let him into that kind of situation he is not going to forgive them so it is a kind of a thriller mystery thriller book i robot 1950 by isaac asimov technically a short story collection i robot introduced asimov's three laws of robotics and you will be very happy to know that the robotics laws that still stand in this world today has been designed by isaac asimov he was the one to give the laws to establish the laws we will talk of these laws very um quickly in our next lecture but don't worry about it right now so the three there is something called the three law of robotics we will study them and it is an influential work exploring the relationship between humans and intelligent robots that time the technical term was intelligent robots but now it is we have the idea of artificial intelligence we also call them androids that time they call them intelligent robots now we move on to the new wave science fiction after the golden age of science fiction after having known the abc of science fiction getting to know the big 3 of science fiction we are moving into the new wave of science fiction here you will see that this is a response to the traditional science fiction in traditional science fiction we were seeing that okay alien species time travel space travel there are very uh, neat concepts which are not intertwined so in this one those things are getting intertwined we will see that very quickly experiment with styles themes approach etc in this era 
people started thinking what more can we add to a science fiction narrative is it only about the science is it only about hard science remember hard science we discussed it in the previous uh, lecture hard science fiction and softer science fiction there is a difference i will shortly or briefly summarize it hard science fiction are those which has maximum science fiction materials into it and softer science fictions are those which have lesser uh, science fiction materials in it and uh, uh, more of story anthropology sociology psychology history all of these things all of these elements are more in number so here we will see that the softer science fiction genres gained a lot of popularity although there was science in everything there was a, a very basic concept of science in it but in the end it was all about human life that is why we sometimes call science fiction as after all a metaphor for human condition but we will talk about it in a later lecture dying inside by robert silverberg a novel the life of a telepath telepath is again uh, related to a person who can read minds so my mind is here the moment i think of you my mind has gone into your mind and i am going to know what you are thinking so from there we have the word telepathy okay telepath who is losing his psychic abilities so this telepath is actually losing his psychic abilities he is not able to read other people's mind anymore instead of showing the story as a person who can do incredible feats it is the story of a person who is losing in life so this is a very interesting concept that a story is not always about the magnanimous the magnificence of a character it sometimes shows the reality of a character that is why literature is very close to life it delves into the introspective and psychological aspects of the protagonist's life and emotions gender and sexual issues in her science fiction works often called as one of the feminist science fiction writers Ursula K Le Guin talks about androgyny talks about ambisexuality in her science fiction works she is the uh, writer she is uh, very famous for her hainish cycle series one of the novel in that series is the left hand of darkness published in 1969 sit on the planet gethen where the inhabitants can shift between male and female genders it explores the themes of gender politics cultural understanding stand on zanzibar by john bruner a novel set in a future overpopulated world weaves together various storylines and narrative techniques to portray a complex and interconnected society again this is a social metaphor just google the word metaphor if it is difficult to understand you will find it it's a very easy the dispossessed published in 1974 again by ursula k le guin a novel from le guin's hainish cycle so the previous novel is the left hand of darkness the next novel is the dispossessed the novel contrasts the societies of two neighboring planets anaris and eurus to explore themes of anarchism utopia and social structures a scanner darkly 1977 by philip k dick a novel a blend of science fiction and psychological thriller exploring themes of drug abuse surveillance and identity an undercover agent investigating a dangerous drug called substance d while facing an identity crisis so this story is not about science fiction or the uh, not only about science fiction or the invention of drug d substance is also another euphemistic term for drugs 
So it is not only about the invention of the substance D or the dangerous addiction to it, but is also about identity crisis. A novel with a character who suffers identity crisis, but the backdrop, the background is that of science fiction. Dangerous Visions, 1967, edited by Harlan Ellison. Edited means it's not a, a novel, it is a collection. It's a short story anthology, significant contribution to new wave science fiction. It is a collection of stories. All the stories are fantastic and they push the boundaries of the genre addressing controversial topics. So if you want to discuss uh, sex, gender, religion, politics, then it becomes a controversy. So the science fiction stories that are included in this particular edition, you will find that they have such topics within them. Nova 1968 by Samuel R. Delaney, a space opera. Space opera means a story about space, but the story has drama, the story has fighting, the story has music, the story has tragedy. All the acting elements, all the movie elements that we generally see are inside this uh, narrative which is called a space opera. Set in a far future universe, the adventures of a crew on a quest for the rare and powerful element known as alleged, of course, you can see the pun, right? Pun, the word alleged means something which is not legal, something which is not sanctioned by the government, something which is not fair. So the word alleged itself shows that this quest is not legal. This quest is something one is doing uh, by defying the said norms and boundaries of the society. So Nova is uh, uh, looking for this particular alleged with a crew on a quest. The Lath of Heaven by Ursula K. Le Guin. Again, she is there. A novel. A man's dreams alter reality, leading to unintended and often disastrous consequences. The story raises questions about the nature of reality and the ethical implications of manipulating it. If you manipulate reality, reality will affect or impact your own personal life. Cyberpunk and post-cyberpunk, 1980s to 1990s. Now let me tell you what is cyberpunk. It is related to the virtual reality, to the internet platforms. So before this, when we were talking about new wave science fiction, internet was not that easy or accessible to everybody. But during the cyberpunk era, internet became very much common. Everybody could afford internet. Everybody was having a social profile inside the Facebook, Orkut, LinkedIn. Everywhere we are having profiles where we are putting up pictures, sharing information about us. All the participants in that same social media site are able to look at our pictures, get to know about our social profile and everything has become a part of that virtual reality. So the key features during this era is technological advancement, of course, virtual reality due to thanks to international networking system also called as the internet. And thirdly, the impact of information technology on society. So these profiles that we have on Facebook, Orkut, LinkedIn, don't you get friend requests? Yes, you get friend requests. People come and talk to you. Who are you? What are you doing? What is your age? Most importantly, they want to connect with you, although they you are complete strangers. Oh, now that it can have an effect or impact, it can be a scam. But even then, you are accessible to the 6 million people, to the 6 billion people on this planet. So it isn't Shouldn't there be a, an impact of that, an effect of that? There must be some kind of changes in the society because of this accessibility. Because anybody can reach you at any time from any corner of the world. So there is definitely an impact of information technology on society. These are the famous works from during the cyberpunk and post-cyberpunk era. That is The Neuromancer by William Gibson. 
one of the seminal novels of cyberpunk a washed up computer hacker see this is a very popular character in the cyberpunk era there is always a computer hacker one who is hacking the system one who is going into the alternative possibilities of how to shut down the government how to create a very anarchic world where uh, i will go and attack the jail management system and oh i will set all the prisoners free i will attack a bank software i will take all the money or i will delete all the accounts so these kind of computer hackers are very central to the idea of cyberpunk science fiction as he gets involved in a complex web of corporate espionage espionage means you are given information which you are not supposed to tell others but you are telling that to others so you are hold you are held responsible for leaking information out of the system therefore you are punishable by law so that is espionage and virtual reality hacking introduced and popularized the concept of cyberspace so the personalities the profiles that we have built in all the social media social media websites applications that is the cyberspace that we are living in right now you are looking at me from the computer screen i am in your cyberspace i am in this physical location now it is very true but you are in the cyberspace and i am sharing that same cyberspace with you right now you are my student i am your teacher we are uh, although we are miles apart but the cyberspace has brought us right in front of you so that is the cyberspace very interesting concept blade runner do androids dream of electric sheep 1968 by philip k dick remember philip k dick we had also read in the new wave science fiction but again i told you right in the beginning of the lecture that these demarcations are very um, fluid you need not contain uh, or restrain your thinking according to the ages the writers can belong to both the ages as well so philip k dick a novel adapted as a film blade runner set in a post apocalyptic future a bounty hunter tasked with retiring rogue androids known as replicants so here we are talking about androids we have started talking about androids previously we were talking about intelligent robots where we are discussing asimov uh, i robot but here you see when we are talking about blade runner we are not calling them as intelligent robots we have actually started calling them as androids snow crash a neil stephenson by neil stephenson a novel set in a near future america a hacker see again a cyberpunk and pizza delivery driver stumbles upon a deadly virtual drug called snow crash so this is not a physical drug this is a virtual drug this is something which is which does not exist in reality but exist in the cyberspace that we are talking about ghost in the shell by masamun shiro a manga ghost in the shell of course it's japanese so it is masamune shiro a manga is a cyberpunk classic a cyber cop in a world where cybernetic enhancements are common explores identity consciousness and the impact of technology on society altered carbon this is very famous i'm sure all of us are aware of this particular series by richard k morgan in a future where consciousness can be transferred between bodies or called as sleeves a former soldier is hired to investigate a wealthy man's murder the novel combines cyberpunk noir and detective fiction noir is again a very interesting concept we will talk about this in later lectures the matrix it's uh, one of the best motion pictures that cinematic world has produced which is related to science fiction it talks about simulation the very first time so 
It is one of the best science fiction stories that has been ever put into movie. It talks about simulation. Simulation is that I am thinking in my mind that I am living in a society. But actually what I am doing is I am sitting in a chair and I am wired to a computer system which makes me think that I am living in a society. So, a highly influential film explores the concept of a simulated reality in which humans are unaware of their enslavement by machines. This is the last part of contemporary science fiction. This is the last part of this era that we are discussing contemporary science fiction by contemporary science fiction late 20th century to present. The Three Body Problem 2008 by Liu Cixin, a Chinese science fiction novel, the first in the Remembrance of Earth's Past trilogy, Humanity's Encounter with an Alien Civilization and the Consequences that Follow, Annihilation 2014 by Jeff Vandermeer, the first book in the Southern Reach trilogy. See, all these are trilogies, that is, three books. Very interesting. Once you start writing science fiction, there is no stopping. A team of scientists as they explore Area X, a mysterious and dangerous territory. Red Mars by Kim Stanley Robinson. The first in the Mars trilogy. Again, it's again a complete section of three books. Offers a detailed and realistic depiction of the terraforming and colonization of Mars. Scientific accuracy is very clear in this one. An exploration of the social and political implications of space exploration. The Power by Naomi Alderman, a novel where women suddenly develop the ability to release electrical jolts, leading to a shift in power dynamics and society structures. Can you imagine a society where women have suddenly developed this supernatural power of giving electric shock so they cannot be dominated they have the ultimate power the expand series 2011 present by james s a corey pen name for daniel abram and ty frank so two people are writing together the expanse series it starts with the Leviathan Wakes and presents a gripping space opera. See, again this word comes space opera set in a future. Humanity has colonized the solar system. The entire, all the planets are carrying human beings in them right now. Facing political tensions, discovery of alien technology. Ancillary Justice by Anne Leckie. The first book in the Imperial Ragged Trilogy, again a combination of three books. A former AI-driven warship on a quest for vengeance against those who betrayed her identity and personhood. These things are uh, very important. The identity of a woman and her personhood. I am a person also. I am not only a woman. So all these things are there in this book. The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers, a space opera novel, diverse crew of the spaceship warfarer as they embark on a dangerous mission, character-driven narratives, themes of inclusivity and cooperation. So you see that space opera comes again and again in the vicinity of contemporary science fiction. Lastly, the fifth season by N.K. Jemisin, the first book in the Broken Earth trilogy. Again, you'll find trilogy takes place in a world plagued by catastrophic environmental events known as fifth season. We have four season and this catastrophic event that the earth is facing is the fifth season. It won the Higo Awards for the best novel three years in a row. Now, these are some questions that you need to answer in order to be sure that you have had the most from this lecture. There are a total of 8 questions 
Once you go through all these questions, just have a look at the screen. Once you go through all these questions and you're able to answer them one by one, you will know that this lecture has contributed much to your knowledge base of science fiction. Here is a list of references age-wise. So you have references from golden age of science fiction, new wave science fiction, cyberpunk age science fiction, contemporary age science fiction. All these are separate ages. These books contribute to the ideas expressed together. These books carry the ideas expressed together historically in these particular ages or eras. So thank you very much for this. I hope you have learned a great deal. We see you in the next lecture. Thank you.